Hi there, I'm Dre, the host and founder of the Dragon Network. On this week's video, I would like to talk about accountable care organizations or ACOs. And really, I just want to go over a high level summary of what an ACO is and sort of how they fit into our healthcare environment, and in particular, the healthcare environment in the US. So first and foremost, an ACO is not a health insurance plan. It is often discussed in the context of health insurance and in the context of payments. It isn't in and of itself a payment structure or a payment plan. So it's actually a contract agreement between a provider or a group of providers and a payer. So for most of the ACOs in the US, at present, that payer tends to be the government in a lot of situations. There are absolutely some private payer ACOs out there but it all got started with government payments and sort of that's where the bulk of the ACOs currently live. So back in 2010, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, Section 3002 added a new section to the Social Security Act. And that new section asked the secretary or required the secretary to create a shared savings program that would encourage healthcare providers to collaborate with one another to deliver care. So the underlying concept of an ACO is that healthcare providers and suppliers in the industry work together collaboratively, again, under an agreement, to provide integrated care services to a patient population. And while they're providing that care, they are going to regularly report out on the quality of care that's being provided and then the outcomes that are actually being achieved by that patient population. So the payment model that's actually involved with ACOs is the typical standard fee for service, but there are some risk incentives that are sort of factored in. So with CMS and the ACOs that exist under that umbrella structure, in order to qualify as an ACO, the provider group or the supplier provider combination needs to agree to cover at a minimum 5,000 individuals and they must enter into the agreement for a period no less than three years. So they are going to be assigned a benchmark a spending level based on the services that they're providing and the number of individuals that are uh, inside of their ACO circle. So that benchmark is what they're going to use to actually sort of adjust, engage, and manage with risk inside of that agreement. So the benchmark concept, similar to a capitation model, but again, still with an ACO, they're paid fee for service. So the ACO provides care to the patients, they bill Medicare as they normally would, or bill the payer if it's not a government payer, if it's a private payer. And throughout the term of the agreement, the spending or the payments that are made are compared against that benchmark. So if they come in lower than the benchmark, so if the fee-for-service fees that are paid out is less than the benchmark that was established based on the type of services that they're providing and the number of patients or individuals that would be uh, cared for by that ACO, then they receive a percentage of the difference. So let's say they save, I don't know, 10% off the benchmark. There is a percentage of that, say 1.5%, that the ACO itself would receive as a bonus type payment to encourage them to come in under benchmark. If they go over the benchmark, again, everything is paid fee for service, so there isn't a cap on it, but if they come in over the benchmark, there's two things that can happen with an ACO agreement. So there's a one-way risk, where if they come in over benchmark, then the payer just covers the difference. So that is considered all risk to be on the payer side. Or there is a two-way risk model, where a percentage of the overage is actually covered by both the ACO and the payer. The payer, of course, paying the higher percentage. So you're probably wondering why anyone would want to enter into that two-way payment model. So why would I want to pay 1.5% of my 10% overage if I can have the payer pay all of it? Well, if you pay and enter into that risk agreement, then to offset it, the percentage that you would receive if you came in under benchmark is increased sometimes significantly. So again, the agreement is made up front. So before you know whether you're going to be under or over. So if you agree to take some of the risk of going over, then you can increase your percentage that you would receive if you stay under. So in that example we just talked about where the ACO would receive 1.5% of that 10% should they stay under. If they agree to a two-way risk model, maybe they can up that to 2% or 2.5%. And again, these percentages, just making them up off the top of my head, I have absolutely no idea what these agreements really look like and what the percentages are, but just for example purposes, I'm just using simple numbers here. So do these ACO models work? Well, there's some mixed reviews on whether they work or not. They are still based on the traditional fee-for-service model, so there is still some inefficiencies and some you know, opportunities within the system itself to have more of a value-based focus 
and more of an outcomes driven model. So that's one component that um, not necessarily to say it doesn't work, but there's still certainly room for improvement in that area. The other concern is that with the benchmarking, as people are continually working to come in under benchmark, benchmarks get adjusted. So there is some concern in the industry with a long-term ACO model, what that would look like and how they would really find the actual benchmark that they need to try to get everyone to. ACOs and the way that they're structured, there isn't a really sort of consistent model that exists as far as agreement goes. So there's all different types of combinations of providers and suppliers that are forming together to have these agreements. So you can't really compare one contract against the other. They're of course negotiated in different ways as well. So there is some concern sort of long-term what that's gonna look like and how that's gonna play out. But for now, the ACOs are in place. They are sort of increasing when it comes to the private space, but certainly they're in the government space under CMS. And there's also um, similar type of models to these ACOs that are existing and sort of popping up around the world. So we'll see how this plays out over time. And hopefully this very brief explanation of what they are helps you to understand what that term means the next time you see it or the next time it comes up in a meeting. I hope you have a wonderful week. If you haven't had a chance yet, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Turn on those notifications so that you're notified every Thursday when I post a new video. And I will see you again next week.